So, examples of the uh, valuation methods. So here's first in, first out. Somehow that's doing that. Okay, first in, first out. Um, the stuff that comes in first, we sell first. Or at least, we may not sell it first, but we're going to pretend that we do. Okay? So it doesn't necessarily match the flow of goods. So, beginning inventory. We have a thousand pieces. They cost us five dollars and twenty-five cents a piece. That's fifty-two hundred and fifty bucks. Everybody, follow me so far. Good. We made some purchases. We bought five hundred more at five dollars and thirty cents, or twenty-six hundred and fifty bucks. We bought three hundred more for five dollars and sixty cents, sixteen hundred and eighty bucks. We bought two fifty at five eighty, two hundred at five ninety. In total, we have twenty-two hundred and fifty pieces that we paid a total of. $12,210 for. Everybody good with this? Okay. At the end of the year, we have 1,200 pieces left. So how many did we actually sell? 1,050. Good. How many dollars goes in cost of goods sold is the question. And what's the value of our ending inventory? Can anybody tell me? Don't even try. We're going to go to the next slide. <laughs> Okay, so first in, first out. Here's all the same data. Here's how many we bought. Here's the price. Okay? Here's, here's our ending inventory. Think about it. First in, first out. We have 1,200 pieces left. So if the first ones that came in are the first ones to sell, these are left because they're the last ones. There's 200 of them. Well, 12, 1,200 minus 200, I have 1,000 to go. So these are left. That leaves me 750. These are left. Leaves me 450. These are left. Well, no, only 450 of them are left. You guys see how I backed into that? So there's 1,200 pieces at each of the individual prices. Good. So what I sold was the 1,000 at 5 and a quarter and 50 of them at $5.30. I sold 1,050 units. Are we good? Yeah. So my ending inventory of what's left is worth $6,695. What I sold was $5,515. So I know what my ending inventory is, I know what my cost of goods sold is, don't I? Good? First in, first out, the first ones went first. Good? Let's see, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's kind of a good thing. The oldest, oh, last in, first out, the oldest items end up in inventory, the, the new ones are what go away. So last in, first out, same data, same 1,200 ending inventory, same 1,050 units sold. Good. So last in, first out, I have 1,200 left, meaning all the first ones are still there, all 1,000 of them, and 200 of these 500 are still there. So my ending inventory is based on the first ones now. What I sold is all the ones that came later. <clears throat> My ending inventory is worth 6310 bucks here and $5,900 cost of goods sold. Anybody see what's going on here? My cost of goods sold is higher because I sold the ones that cost more, the ones that came in at the end. Right? And in this world, things tend to increase in price cost of goods sold has a higher cost. Therefore, net income goes which direction? Down. Down. LIFO gives you lower net income. But higher. It gives you lower inventory cost. Higher cost of goods sold. Say that again? Yeah. More asset. Yeah. 
LIFO gives you lower inventory cost, higher cost of goods sold, lower net income. Why would you want to do that? Taxes. If I have lower net income, I pay less tax. Let's back up. First in, first out, I have higher ending inventory, lower cost of goods sold. If I have lower cost of goods sold, I have higher net income. Why would I want higher net income? I pay more tax. What? Has no impact on cash whatsoever. I still sold the goods and collected money. Theoretically, I sold them for the same price. This is just my cost of goods calculation. Think about it. If I'm running a publicly traded company, I have higher net income, it drives my stock price higher. If the stock price goes up and I have higher net income, my bonus is probably based on what? Both of those things. So if I'm the manager of the company, I get a bigger bonus for using FIFO. I get higher net income for using LIFO. I'm sorry, lower net income for using LIFO. I apologize. And I pay less tax. Average cost. This is fun. I love average cost. <clears throat> Every time you buy or sell something, you recalculate the average cost of your merchandise. Okay? Same data. Everybody's good. Nothing up my sleeve. Same data. All right? <clears throat> so I have 2,250 pieces that cost me $12,200. On average, each piece cost me $5.43. See how we do the math? Simple. I have 1,200 in ending inventory. 1,200 times my average cost gives me my in ending inventory value. I sold 1,050 pieces. 1,050 times my average cost gives me cost of goods sold. Good? Notice FIFO gives you, let's walk through this. I gotta work from this side here, I'm gonna block. Sales are the same. So it has, theoretically has nothing to do with cash. Nothing. Beginning inventory is the same. I bought the same amount of stuff. I have the same amount of stuff available to sell. My ending inventory under first in, first out is the highest. Because I have the, old, the newest stuff at the highest cost, right? Under LIFO, I have the oldest stuff at the lower, lowest cost. And under weighted average, it falls in between somewhere. Calculate your cost of goods sold, operating expenses. You can see that it drives your taxes to be different. So FIFO has lower cost of goods sold, higher taxes. LIFO has higher cost of goods sold, lower taxes. Weighted average falls in the middle. FIFO gives you higher profit, first in, first out. Last in, first out gives you lowest profit. But you pay the least tax. Weighted average falls in between the two. Good. I like this chart. It's great to see them compared side by side. Questions? Could you calculate LIFO and FIFO? You know, you need to oh, maybe. Oh, oh, maybe. Just like this. It's easy if you break it down like this. It's a good visual. Sir? Do you mind? Um... Yes, I mind. I backed into it? Okay, first in, first out. We bought a bunch of stuff. We have 1,200 left. So the first ones, I'm sorry, we, we had 1,200 total available. God, I can't talk. Start over. We bought some stuff. <laughs> 
we have 1,200 left at the end. Okay? So, <clears throat> if it's first in, first out, the beginning ones are left. <clears throat> so I sold the last ones. Sorry, first in, first out. Yeah. Bleh. I sold the first ones. The last ones are left. These would be left. These would be left. These would be left. Think about it. 200, 450, 750, 1200. This is what's left in inventory. These are all gone and 50 of these are gone. So my cost of goods sold is 1000 at, at the price for these and 50 at the price for these. So my cost of goods sold is $1,515. Okay? LIFO is exactly the opposite. These are the ones that are left or uh, used up. Okay? All right. All of a sudden, I'm not able to talk. How late is it? Gosh. Okay. <clears throat> Here you go. First in, first out. And this is a good one. First in, first out, your ending inventory is the cost of the last units you brought in, which means this is about what it's going to cost you to replace that inventory if something happened to it. This is more of a market value of that inventory. Last in, first out, uh, this matches your current cost. The stuff that you just bought and the cost that you paid now, you're treating it as if that's what I sold now. So you're matching current cost with your revenues. Weighted average averages it all out. Good? Okay. Skipping that. We'll talk about that later. All right. We've already kind of talked about this. Um, if you're the manager, you want higher net income because it affects your bonus and your profit. Um, if it's a smaller company, it's just the owner, you're going to pick something that lowers your taxes. Okay? This is big. If you use LIFO, you have to. So small businesses usually use LIFO? LIFO is... LIFO is kind of, how do I say it? LIFO is cool if, you, if you're the business, but if you're a governmental agency or a tax agency, LIFO is not cool. And you try and shun LIFO and tell people not to use it. So this is part of it. If you use it on the tax return, you've got to do it for your financial statements. Think about it. LIFO lowers my income tax, but it lowers my profit. Think about it. it could, if I filed a tax return using LIFO, but did my financial statements for the public using FIFO? You're kind of misleading people a little bit. So they're just saying, if you use LIFO, you're stuck with it. Now, you have a question, sir, then I'll go on. Um, so for LIFO, as you get shipments of the thing that you're selling, yes. um, Yeah, everything's for sale, but you're treating it as if you sold that last one that came to the door, you're selling it first. Okay. And it has a higher cost, theoretically. So it's just, um, it, it might not, not necessarily be as things come in. It might not be the actual one that you sold, but you're treating it as if it were. All right. OK? Cool. So you don't have to actually physically sell the newest one. No, you do not. Just, okay. It's Wonderful. just that's how we're treating it. We're yeah. pretending. Okay? That's why I keep saying it does not match the movement of goods. That makes much more sense. Okay. Now, here's the other thing about LIFO. Let's say we bought something. We bought 100 at a dollar. $100. Right? We bought 200 at $10. We bought 200 at $20. We bought 200 at $1,000. Now I'm doing this dramatically f for a reason. If you're always selling the last ones that came in, you can end up with stuff that you bought. 
a long time ago. 1901. 1901. 1-1-2014. Okay? So you end up with stuff that you bought a long time of time ago. You have you've achieved this lower tax and lower net income for years and years and years and years and years. But you can't change because you're stuck with this. So remember, all of a sudden now we go out and we sell, um, let's say we liquidate and we sell them all. Okay? 1,031 units. 1031. If you were using a first in, first out, your costs would be, you know, would be based on $1,000 a unit, right? So you'd have this great big cost of goods sold number. However, if I sold all of them, what's my cost of goods sold? Let's say I'm selling these things for uh, $2,000 a piece. On this one here, what's my profit? I made $1,900 on that last piece that I sold, according to a LIFO method because I'm picking something that I think I bought in 1901. So I'm paying a whole ton of tax all of a sudden. So with LIFO, these are called LIFO layers. When you start eating into the old LIFO layers, it can become very expensive to you tax-wise. You, you don't want to liquidate ever. <laughs> ever, ever, ever when you have real old stuff. Okay? That's thought one. That's unrelated thought one. <laughs> Related thought number one is <clears throat> these methods behave this way because the economy typically has rising prices. If we ever go into a deflationary period and prices go the other way, FIFO actually returns a lower net income and LIFO actually returns a higher net income. They flip directions on you. Okay? The odds of that happening are fairly remote. We've kind of gone through it a little bit over the last handful of years, a little bit, but not bad, not like a depression. Okay? Even though in, a, in 50 years this will have been called a depression, but that's a different story. It's just my opinion. It was, it was pretty bad. They lied to us about a lot of the statistics that say it's only a recession, I think. <laughs> it's only my opinion. Now they're going to come get me. <laughs> the, the NSA is listening to me. Yeah. The NSA is listening and they're going to come get me. Sir, you have a question. Um, so for companies who use LIFO, the government says you've got to stick with it. Yep. Uh, can they switch at any point to using LIFO? You can make an election to switch. You can only do it once. And you're going to pay all the taxes on all this stuff you've got up here in these early LIFO layers. All right. you okay. LIFO. Yeah, you're going to revalue all that at the later price and pay a whole bunch of tax and bring it up to current value. All right. Good? Yeah. It's, it's a painful thing to do. What if you sold your company and the next person did it the opposite way? Right? If you sell the stock, yes. they don't have a right to revalue. If you sell the assets of the company to a different company, then they get to start a whole different method based on their actual cost of what they paid you for this, which would be market value. Okay? So can you do some trickery and sell it? No. <laughs> <laughs> what, are you going to sell it to yourself? Yeah, so There's re related party sales rules that it come into play. Okay, yeah. So they, they thought of that? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the IRS code comes in these great big thick volumes that are real, real tiny print. They thought of lots of stuff. Yeah. They've had lots of years to think of all this <laughs> stuff. Okay? All right. Everybody good with this? Moving on. Um, this is important. Lower of cost or market. So even though you calculate a valuation method, weighted average, first in, first out, last in, first out, you still give it what I'm going to call the smell test at the end. 
So we had a total value of about $12,000 of all that inventory. What you do is you then go and look and see, has something happened? Could I replace that for less? And if it has, then you change your valuation to the lower cost. What's the market cost? Um, replacement cost is another term for that. Okay? Uh, and if you have a loss, because think, think of it, stuff happens. If I run a store and I have a whole bunch of uh, Apple, I have a whole bunch of iPhones on the shelf, right? I got a whole bunch of iPhone 5s on the shelf. You guys are buying them, you're paying big bucks for them, it's great, I'm making money. They're costing me $400 a piece. Okay, just making up numbers here. Apple announces tomorrow the new iPhone 6 is coming out and they're going to cost me $400. What's the value of the old one? Well, it just tanked, right? Can I sell them for 600 bucks anymore? No. I can replace them. I can buy the iPhone 5 from Apple for 100 bucks now. But I paid four. Well, under the lower of cost or market, I need to adjust my inventory value to that $100 a piece, what I can buy them for now. Because that's all it's really worth. Otherwise, I'm overstating my inventory, right? You put it on your balance sheet that it's worth $400 a piece, and you fool investors, they think, oh, look, he's got all this value up here in inventory. No, it's bogus. They're only worth $100 a piece. You're kind of lying to people, right? So you value it at lower of cost or market. You take the loss in the current period because it's a holding cost. And then if you, whatever you sell them for, you know, say I sell them for 200 bucks, my cost of goods is now $100, I have a hundred dollar profit. Is that like a, a sub account of, of uh, inventory? Uh, no, this is an expense account item. Okay. So you're going to have some sort of uh, cost of goods sold expense, mm -hmm. uh, obsolete inventory expense, something like that. Okay. okay? You can call it holding expense. They put it in brackets because I've never seen it called a holding expense before. Um, so, here's an example. Oh, this is good. We're going to use high tech. Intel processors and disk drives. We have a thousand processors and 400 disk drives. The processors cost us 250, the drives cost us 100 bucks. I can buy new processors for 200 bucks. Oops, I got a problem, right? The drives, I can buy more drives for 110 bucks. Under the lower of cost or market, I use the $100, my cost, for the drives, but I need to lower the value of the processors to 200 bucks. So quantity times lower of cost or market. So instead of, at cost, my inventory was worth 290. At lower of cost or market, my inventory is only worth 240. I'm going to take a hit to cost of goods sold for 50 grand. Everybody see this? Really straightforward. You do it on an item by item basis. Sir? Uh, can you explain the disk drives? Where it says that it costs $100 for the replacement cost? Right. So, nope. Lower of cost or market. So I'm not going to record a gain. Under GAP, we have this rule about being conservative. So, we haven't sold this yet, so I'm not going to recognize a gain on it because I haven't sold it. I only do that when I sell it, but if I have a loss, I recognize the loss now. So I'm going to continue to show the drives at its original cost, lower of cost or market, but I have to take the processors and write them down to the market value. Good? Okay. Yeah, no, you're going to have to say, um, wrote Intel uh, processor chips down to lower of cost or market, $50 per unit times 1,000 units, bang. Okay? Other question? Yes? How often would you be reevaluating your inventory and changing your cost? Theoretically, at least once a year. 
if not more often. Hopefully you don't have stuff sitting around that long. Because <clears throat> it's cash, remember? So, <clears throat> have I told you this story? When I interview people for a job, I ask them, what is inventory? What is the correct answer? It's, it's cash. <laughs> it's cash in a different form. So when a company buys inventory, they, they pay for it with cash, so they're taking a risk. Your entire job at that point in time is to turn that back into cash as fast as possible. So inventory is cash in a different form. Um, inventory turnover, cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. Okay? This tells you how many times you bought inventory and sold it during the year. This is a good number. Why? Anybody want to take a stab at it? I'm going to come over here and I'm having more what? Well, let me, let me show you an example here. I bought a thousand units at ten dollars a piece for ten thousand dollars. Okay? This is a year. Now I sold all of, all of those for fifteen dollars a piece, fifteen times a thousand, means I make how much money? 15,000 against 10, I make a $5,000 profit. Good. But how much money did I put at risk to make a $5,000 profit? I put 10 grand. This is an inventory turn. I buy 100 of them at 10. How much inventory do I have at risk? $1,000. I sell them all. I buy a hundred more for ten dollars. I have a thousand dollars at risk. I buy a hundred more for ten dollars. And I do this ten times. How much money do I still, I still sold the same number. I sold them at fifteen. I still make the same five thousand dollars. How much did I put at risk at any one time? A thousand bucks. Inventory turns are king. <clears throat> I'm doing the same profit on a whole lot less cash. Yes, you're, you're managing your inventory better, you, you generate more cash flow, or you're saving cash that would otherwise be tied up in inventory. Um, you're being much more efficient and smart about what you're doing. So think about it. If, if, if you guys started a business and you had to have 10 grand to buy inventory, how hard would it be for you? Anybody in here going to step forward and say, I'll do it? All right. How many of you would step forward if it only cost you $1,000 to start your business? A whole lot more, right? Lower entry, lower barrier to entry. Just have to figure out how much product you're going to sell in a week and purchase that. Right. Okay? Questions? So that's what an inventory turn is and why it's important. Cool? Cool. Go. Let's see. Cash flows. <clears throat> Here we go. When you buy inventory, you use cash. When you sell inventory, you yeah. get cash. Moving on. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, okay. You don't see many companies use LIFO anymore because it's kind of a pain. Because you, if you use LIFO, you, you have to track all of your inventory with FIFO anyway. Because under SEC rules, you have to tell the world, here's what it would look like if I did FIFO. I'm using LIFO, but I, here's what it would look like if I did FIFO. So you're doing it, you're doing it twice. <clears throat> you pay less tax. But you're doing a whole ton of push-ups to get there. Yeah. So a lot of people don't do it because it's not worth it. But there's some very old companies floating around that have those real old LIFO layers, you know, from before these rules were put in place <clears throat> that are kind of stuck with it. Okay? Uh, let's see. 
common sense stuff, right? Lock up your inventory. <clears throat> What's the most likely thing to get stolen from your business? Cash. Cash. After that, stuff. Lock up your stuff. Limit access to your stuff. Maintain perpetual inventory. Count your inventory. Go out and make sure it's there. A lot of people cycle count. They count a little bit of stuff every day instead of having that one great big inventory search at the end of the year. Those are no fun, by the way. <laughs> if you've ever done them, they're no fun. No, they... Okay, this is, my, uh, this is the other class I should be teaching on inventory management. You count a little bit of stuff every day so that over a two week period you end up counting everything. You count the stuff that moves more often, you count it more often. You count the stuff that moves hardly ever, much less often, and you end up keeping better inventory records as a result. Okay, we could have a whole 17 week class on this, but not going there. <laughs> Sir? <laughs> It drives people nuts. I mean, it's, it's an up here kind of thing. Sometimes even for me. <laughs> you had a question? No, I disagree. Was that, was that a high? Not even a thumbs up? There you go. I have to beg for him, but I got one. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, perpetual and periodic inventory systems. These are fairly self explanatory. A periodic inventory system was uh, what we just showed you a minute ago where, you know how we calculated last in, first out, and first in, first out? We did it like at the end of the year, we tracked all the purchases, calculated the value, and then backed into it. That's periodic. In the modern world, we have these, we got these great big computer things. And they'll calculate it, you know, the minute you push the button, it calculates it. So the minute you make a sale, it'll calculate it. The minute you do an inventory receipt of new stuff, it'll calculate it. So it's tracking this stuff on a perpetual basis. Okay? I would not recommend doing perpetual by hand. It will be a pain. Um, all right, moving on. Um, Okay. <clears throat> in a periodic system, we use the account called purchases. We've all seen that. In a perpetual system, the system goes and parks it right to inventory automatically. So it kind of skips that step. Um, the rest of it I've already kind of talked about. It calculates it as you go. Every time you do a sale, it calculates cost. Good. No, 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 no. Here we go. These are fun. <clears throat> If you make a boo-boo, because -boo, mistakes happen, right? So if you, you're ending up inventory, if you overstate the value of your inventory, say it's supposed to be 10,000, but you record it as $12,000 worth of inventory, what happens? Your inventory, ending inventory is overstated. Your profits are lower because you've got lower cost of goods sold. So your retained earnings are off as well. So your cost of goods sold is lower, your profits are higher, your profit makes your retained earnings go up. Okay? If you understate your ending inventory, it means you have higher cost of goods sold, lower profit, which drives lower retained earnings. Good? Um, same thing, you can have, if I made a mistake last time, it'll have an impact on this month's income statement as well because I start with a wrong beginning inventory. Okay? So, and these are reversed though. So if I have overstated inventory, uh, it doesn't affect my ending. That's my beginning that's overstated. But it creates lower net income. And if I understate it, it creates higher net income. Cool? Conceptually, you got to kind of think this one through. Questions on it? All right. Well, we're good. Let's stare at this one some more. You might see something like this on an exam. Okay. Cool. Okay. I said might. I don't know how near of a future. Let's come over here. Let's do it over here. Um, I'm going to grab this color 
first. Color, color, color. Okay. So my beginning inventory is 10,000. My ending inventory is 6,000. Cost of goods sold 45, right? Let's say I, m I mess this up and I overstate my ending inventory and it's 8. It's supposed to be 6, but I record it as 8. What happens to my net income? Goes down. Good? Okay. I think that's the easy one. Let's monkey with beginning inventory. Let's say this is understated. It's supposed to be 10, but we record it as 5. What happens? My delivered cost of goods sold goes down. Oh, no, that stays the same. My cost available goes down to 46. 46 minus 6, my cost of goods sold becomes 40. So it drops quite a bit, right? If I overstate it, on the other hand, this becomes 56. 56 minus that creates 50,000 cost of goods sold. So you see how either one of these, being wrong, can send this thing either direction. Yes, sir? I don't think so. Let's go through it again. All right. Okay. Which one? The beginning inventory adjustments I was making or the ending inventory adjustments? Both. Okay. Let's return to normal. All right. <clears throat> Let's affect our ending inventory. Okay. So our ending, we have $51,000 goods available for sale. Our ending inventory, instead of being 6, is overstated and it's 10. This is like you count a pallet of goods twice on accident. Yeah. OK. okay. 10,000 ending inventory leaves me a cost of goods sold of 41. Let's come match it against this. My ending inventory is overstated. So my ending inventory is too high. My cost of goods sold is lower. It went down from 45 to 41, which means my net income will go up. Okay? All right. Cool. All right. You know, you're better off if you understand the concept rather than just memorizing the chart. You guys want to do a few more of them, or are you good? I Sir? I just have one quick question. I, I might be like if you overstate your inventory on one inventory period, then your beginning inventory for the following month is less. So why the NA or the don't have to do with each other? Okay, so down here we just overstated our ending inventory. Yeah. The following month, this becomes the beginning inventory up here. And then let's say we get our ending inventory correct. So my ending inventory is not off, is all that's saying. NA, no, no yeah. But it still is going to have an impact on my cost of goods sold. So those two aren't really related, like the <coughs> beginning doesn't follow that ending inventory, they're kind of separate. Yeah, but if you have a beginning inventory problem, and you rectify it by getting it right this month, it still has an impact on your profitability, your net income down here, and your cost of goods sold. Okay? Questions? Yeah, it was wrong to begin with, but we fixed it. It's still creating havoc. But it won't create havoc next month because we fixed it. That's very interesting. So on a test, you said we might see this on a test. Like, what are we. I think it's a good idea, don't you? I, I accept your suggestion. Are you going to add like, this graph and like, have us put like, plus and minuses on like, how it will affect? Or what do you, what do you yeah. I don't know. I haven't thought it up yet. I may, I may ask you if, inven if beginning inventory is overstated, what happens to net income? It would probably be on the multiple. So it would be like a short one. Or yeah. Not or I'll draw out a little chart and make you calculate it and show me. Or I don't know yet. I've got to come up with something. 
Well, the quiz is done. The quiz, the quiz went live a couple hours ago, so it's now going to be on an exam. Yeah. And that's due by Wednesday at 6. Wednesday at 6, yeah. Okay? Questions? Answers? Can I do one more? Yes. Which kind would you like to do? Uh, do what? Do both of what? Okay. So my beginning inventory is 10. Bought some more stuff. I could have sold $51,000 worth of stuff. My ending inventory is really six. What do you, what do you want to misrepresent the number as? Uh, overstated. overstated. It's 16. Okay? So my ending inventory is 16, so the bank thinks I have more assets, right? What happens to my cost of goods sold? 51 minus 16 is now $35,000 cost of goods sold. $35,000 cost of goods sold makes my net income go which direction? Up. Okay. So now let's go the other direction. Beginning inventory is supposed to be 10. What do you want to make it? I did five already. 20. My beginning inventory is 20. That means I have 20 plus 41. I have $61,000 worth of stuff I could sell. Minus 6, my cost of goods sold is now 55 instead of 45. If my cost of goods sold is 10,000 higher, my net income is 10,000 lower. Okay? Yeah. Are you with me so far? Your problem is always going to start with an ending inventory, though. Yep. You're just going to throw off the next you're going to usually get it right, usually get it right, and then when you screw this up, it becomes the next month's, and then you'll get it right again, and it'll flush through the system, and you're okay. But it's going to screw up two months or two years, whatever time frame you're doing. If it's years, you're going to screw up two years' worth of stuff, which isn't good. If you're publishing publicly traded financial... SEC stuff, you've got to go back and say, hey, we screwed up, here you go. And then all of a sudden, nobody has any confidence in your stuff anymore. <laughs> so nobody ever does that. No, you have to. Yeah, it used to be you didn't, but now you do. It's a big, big deal. Restatements are, are, have become a fairly common thing. Do you get like a fine or something if you have to resubmit something? Or I don't think so. Kind of no. As long as, you, as long as you do it, you just look stupid, yeah. Happens all the time. Look it up. Google um, uh, accounting restatements. They'll pop up. There'll be a bunch of them. Other questions? Yes, it's, uh, just in the case of a small business, and you want to fix that, what did you do? Just an adjustment? Or? No, you let it flush through the next month or year. Unless, unless you go back and restate, then you correct this and restate, reissue correct statements. In the old days, it would just flow forward and get corrected the following period. Yes, no, yes, ma'am. Okay. Here we go. So, I need to create an example. So this goes back to 10, 41, 51. Uh, 6 gives you 45. Good? So instead of going with 6, we're going to go with 16. 16 gives me $35,000 cost of goods sold. So my net income is plus 10. Yes? Everyone agrees? Okay, the following year, 16 becomes my beginning inventory. Good? I'm going to assume this, everything else is the same. 40, 1, minus 1, 1, 
41, 51. Ending inventory. Now we're going to get my ending inventory right. 6. Oops, I did my math wrong. I apologize. <clears throat> 41 plus 16 is not 51. It's 57, yes? Ending inventory is 6. Cost of goods sold is now 51. Okay? If I had gotten it right over there, this would have been 6 plus 41 is 47 minus 6, cost of goods sold is 41. So if my, if my cost of goods sold is 51, my net income is $10,000 too low, <clears throat> but between the two, they cancel out, I'm good. So it corrects itself as soon as I get that in ending inventory right. Too, too fast or did I do okay? You're good? Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> Other answers? What do you guys want to do next? Go home is the right answer. <laughs> See you next week.